right. Hi. Good morning. I apologize for the delay. Um, I was on live producer. I was trying to um, go live, but apparently there were some issues. And so I had to restart and create a whole new video. Um, good morning once again. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Crystal. All right. Um, okay. So I'll just begin with the introductions. Again, hopefully uh, more people will stream in or maybe people will watch this video afterwards. All right, so once again, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this is our last Eco Poetry reading for Thrive Our Community Corner, and I'm really thankful to have been able to be a part of this um, initiative. So thank you um, to Crystal for inviting me on board. I'm Esther Vincent, the co-editor and founder of the Tiger Moth Review, which is Singapore's first eco-journal of art and literature that publishes poetry, prose, art and photography um, from around the world. And I'm honoured to be here today to read um, as a way to raise funds for the needy families at Beyond Social Services. Okay, if you can, please, um, I should include the link later on in the comments section um, for you to make a donation and every dollar will go to a good cause. So if you can, please donate. All right, for today's reading, I've prepared five poems, once again, five poems every week um, that are intertextual in nature, meaning that they respond to an existing text or they were written in response to an existing text. And since this is our final reading, I've also prepared something special and that is I'll be reading a poem of mine which has not been read before anywhere else, um, also unpublished. It's entitled Lemon Beach. Um, written after Linda Gregg's Greece When Nobody's Looking. So I'll read Linda Gregg's poem first, and, I'll, and then I'll read my poem. And the poems will take us to Greece, Mauritius, the Pacific island of Guam, Nigeria, and finally Anne in Canada, in the coast Salish, uh, Salish nation. All right, so for our first um, poem today, Greece When Nobody's Looking, by Linda Gregg, it's taken from this book, yeah. So I'd like to show the book, um, Sacraments of Desire, okay, Sacraments of Desire by Linda Gregg, and this is on page 11. So let me just go there, page 11, and I'll begin. Greece when nobody's looking. The earth bleached pale by 2,000 years. Poppies and weeds blooming in the tough fields. Stillness and olive trees. I asked the young woman if she made things woven or sewed. No, she said, we don't care. The sea is calm today as ever it was in May. And the moon almost full. A poetry of stars and stone and the ordinary. All right, so that was Linda Gregg's poem, a very short eight-line poem, also known as an octave. Um, I'll just let, I'll just read what um, W.S. Merwin writes about Linda Gregg's poem. So Merwin is an American poet and also um, twice the U.S. Poet Laureate. So he has praised Gregg's poems, observing that they are original in the way that really matters. They speak clearly of their source, they are inseparable from the surprising, unrolling, eventful, pure current of their language, and they convey at once the pain of individual loss, a steady and utterly personal radiance. So this is what Merwin says, um, and it's found on Poetry Foundation. And a little bit more about Greg, so that you understand the context um, of her work. So Greg actually lived in Greece in the 1960s with the poet um, Jack Gilbert in very humble conditions and reportedly only with three oil lamps and a mattress. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so the title is very suggestive, Greece When Nobody's Looking. It is evocative of a speaker who promises to show us a different side of Greece when nobody's looking. And as its title suggests, um, the poem pulses with the lifeblood of Greece. So Linda Gregg writes also um, in an article that she wants to write poems with lifeblood. 
So I do feel that this poem pulses with the lifeblood of Greece when tourists have come and gone um, through the eyes of an outsider who has lived locally for some time with minimal creature comforts. Um, it is a very short poem which mirrors the poet's minimalist living conditions and philosophy comprised of eight lines. Um, it is an octave holding an entire country in its poetic body. In terms of the imagery, it highlights the quiet beauty of a place whose earth has been bleached pale by 2,000 years. And so when I read this line, when I read and read it again, um, what I think of is that the line juxtaposes the concept of time um, in, in terms of earth or ecological time as compared to human time, right? What is 2,000 years to um, a human being and what is 2,000 years to the earth? To ask this question, right? What does it really mean? And what I love about this poem is the sparse and plain diction that says so much in so little, um, that gets to the heart of the matter, reflecting Greg's use of language at its most elemental. And this, of course, is her craft, right? When it is stripped bare of embellishments and intellectualisms. So, for instance, in the lines, poppies and weeds blooming in the tough fields. Very simple language, easy to understand. Um, void of any, uh, devoid of any metaphors, even. And what this says is that the flowers and the weeds grow alongside one another in harsh conditions. And the line, and the moon almost full, you notice that the diction is unembellished, just very plain and simple, and yet evocative in conjuring the imagery of the moon. In this case, Greece is the main focal point in the poem, with the poet describing the landscape's earth, fields, trees, sea, and moon. And the speaker, if you notice, only enters the poem in the fourth line, interacting with a local woman. The dialogue debunking popular stereotypes associated with local culture and crafts when she says, no, we don't care. And the poem evokes a sense of stillness, calm, and minimal human activity, with the poem centering the landscape, the natural landscape of Greece, to offer readers a poetry of stars and stone and the ordinary. And in fact, this is the only metaphor present in the poem. Yet, I find that Greg has the ability to turn what she describes as the ordinary into something quite extraordinary, which is evident in her poem. All right. Okay, so in the comment section, thank you, Crystal. Um, the link to donate has been included. So if you're watching this video now or later, um, please consider donating if you're able to. Thank you very much. All right, so if we go back to um, Linda Gregg's poem, Greece When Nobody's Looking, I actually love this poem so much that I thought I would try my hand at um, writing after her. So the next poem that I'll be reading is a poem of mine entitled Limon Beach. So it refers to a place in the southwest of Mauritius where I went for my honeymoon last year. And I write after Linda Gregg in terms of the form and the style as well. Um, unlike Linda Gregg, I did not um, get to spend years in Mauritius. So I was just there for over two weeks. And in fact, um, in Le Monde itself for maybe a week, around a week. So for me, it is actually through my writing and through reading my poems that I'm able to return, uh, return, reimagine and re-enter this moment, uh, time and place, which is Le Monde Beach. Uh, yeah, so I mentioned that I write after her form, her craft. And um, in terms of content, I try to, of course, uh, place is quite different in this case, and the experience and the memories are also quite different. And maybe I won't say too much about it. I'll just read my poem and you'll see, you'll be able to notice certain similarities. Okay, so Limon Beach. The night is a new kind of blackness that surprises. Infinite stars like crushed ice overhead. This is land birthed by fire and water millions of years ago. 
She asked, Do you want to go and watch the Sega? Yes, he said, and they brought along the bottle. Music on the beach, a crew directing Sega dances by bonfire and spotlight. The sea crashing into the dazzling sky. A poetry of blue lagoons, bleached coral, and bonfires smoldering. All right, so you'll notice certain similarities. That was Limon Beach, like the octave format, the use of two characters in the poem as well, and the final line that begins with a poetry of, and then um, blue lagoons, bleached coral, bonfires smoldering. So unlike Linda Gregg as well, she uses uh, fewer words. I use more words here. The poem is set on Limon Beach. So, um, yes, I mentioned last uh, that I was there for my honeymoon last year. Um, historically, for those of you who might not be um, aware of this, Limon or Limon Brabon has a darker, a darker history, one of slavery, maronage and resistance. And in fact, the mountain um, in Limon stands as a symbol for the slaves' fight for freedom um, between the 18th and 19th century. So that's it, um, with that history in mind. The Sega is actually a very important dance because um, the slaves, it has its origin in slavery and it is a very much intense and emotional improv, uh, improvised dance which expresses the tribulations of, the, of an enslaved people um, and it is now considered the national music of Mauritius. So in this way, I have weaved um, some of the cultural history into the poem yeah, but that's it, my personal experience and memory of the place as an outsider, as a visitor um, on my honeymoon, of course, is very different from um, a local or even someone who was there in the 18th to the 19th century. So in effect, I was very much in awe of the place, in wonder of the beauty of the night in its um, dark glory. And when I describe a new kind of blackness that surprises the speaker, and that's why I focus on the setting and the landscape rather than um, the history of the place. And in Singapore, I think those of us who have been to Singapore, who live in Singapore, or who are living in Singapore, um, will agree that the night sky is never fully dark because it is polluted by artificial lights. And I find that this actually tames the wildness of the night. And what I loved uh, when I went to Mauritius, what I loved about um, Mauritius was that the night was so different from the day. Um, it was so wild, it was so mysterious, it was so full of a different kind of character of its own. Um, and so I could actually see the infinite stars, which I described here in the poem, they were visible to the human eye. And, and then I could actually imagine, you know, people who were living, uh, who, were, who were seafaring people in the past, you know, how they would have navigated the seas with the stars. It's completely possible when the stars are visible to the human eye. And similar to Greg's poem, um, there are two characters, a, a she and a he. And these are, of course, third person speakers who wander onto the beach when the Sega music beckons to them. I chose to use the third person pronouns um, to create greater distance between the reader um, and the speakers to situate the reader as an observer of a scene in the poem um, just as how as a human being in real life I was an observer to a scene on the beach hence the use of the third person speakers in terms of the theme some of you may have noticed that there were some subtle tensions in the poem between the natural and the man-made um, in terms of cultural history and commodity, with reference to the crew directing the Sega dances by Bonfire and Spotlight. So Bonfire is um, natural fire, natural light. Of course, a man has to create the fire. Um, and Spotlights are, are artificial. Um, between the Sega dances, right? Sega dancing in terms of its history and culture uh, and its origins, as compared to the fact that they were now shooting this Sega dance on the beach. Between nature, natural processes, and ecological damage, 
So for instance, the Blue Lagoon. So the Lagoon is a natural ecological process of weathering over uh, millions of years. And bleached coral and bonfires smoldering. Um, bleached coral, of course, is something quite um, unnatural due to the temperature, the rise in temperature in the sea. And uh, of course, when the, when the coral gets uh, hit by the waves and uh, washed ashore, then they start to lose their colour once they die as well on the shore. And there were many loose corals on Limon Beach. That's what I remember very clearly about the place as well. And we collected um, quite a number of these uh, dead bleached coral and we brought them home. All right, and bonfire smoldering. Also some tensions between creation and destruction. For instance, land birth by fire and water. So volcanic activity is both creative and destructive. It destroys and yet it creates. Um, as well as darkness and light. The imagery of volcanic land, sea and sky in the poem um, pays homage, of course, to the island's geology and natural landscape. And I would say that one way to immortalize memory for me is through poetry and hence the poems I write um, allow me to return each time to this memory and to this place and to this moment in time. And so for me, for Le Monde Beach, of course, this allows me to return to this specific moment, um, which is uh, my honeymoon uh, with my husband at night. All right. I'll move on to the third poem. I hope that this is uh, a good pace for all of you who are watching. Good Fossil Fuels is the next poem, so by Craig Santos Perez. This was published in the Tiger Moth Review in issue 3 on page 39. And Craig is from, uh, he's an academic editor and also a writer from the Pacific Island of Guam. He's now based in Hawaii. He's teaching at the University of Hawaii. And this poem is intertextual in the sense that it is recycled from Maggie Smith's Good Bones. So I have the link to Maggie Smith's poem here, which I will include. Um, yeah, and so you can go and visit it. Yes, okay, if you're interested to read the original poem and to understand how he has recycled the poem. Okay, good fossil fuels. Earth is ruined. Do I deny this to my children? Earth is ruined. And I've ruined it in a thousand carbon-intensive ways. A thousand carbon-intensive ways I'll share with my children. The planet is at least 50% polluted. And that's a conservative estimate. Do I deny this to my children? For every sea, there is waste thrown into the sea. For every sacred place, a place fracked, locked, bombed into dust. Earth is ruined. And the planet is at least half polluted. And for every green garden, there's a toxin that would poison you. Do I deny this to my children? I am trying to sell them doubt. Any decent capitalist profiting from a climate disaster squeals on about good fossil fuels. This growth could be sustainable, right? We could make this growth sustainable. All right, so that was Craig's poem, uh, Good Fossil Fuels. Okay. And you'll notice that this poem is more critical, definitely very critical of what's going on in terms of the fossil fuel industry. Um, in terms of form, it is, it is recycled from Maggie Smith. So the form is exactly the same in terms of sentence structure and the function of the lines. It is interesting because it uses the metaphor of recycling in terms of the recycling of words, of language, of ideas, of a poem to create a new thing from something old. And this makes me as a reader think about the notion of recycling or repurposing rather than simply buying or purchasing brand new things. And so you'll notice that Perez's poem is quite anti-capitalist. It's anti-commodity culture. 
um, as we struggle with climate change. The title itself, Good Fossil Fuels, makes readers question the rhetoric. Is there such a thing as a good fossil fuel? And you notice that in the second last line, there is that question, the rhetorical question. We can make um, this growth could be sustainable, right? Okay, it's a rhetorical question. So I would say that this poem takes a more skeptical tone towards climate action. It poses a challenge to readers. Can there be real change? What can we do? Um, and yet the tone is one of certainty that Earth is ruined. There is the use of repetition throughout the poem. Repetition of a couple of um, phrases. Earth is ruined three times reinforces this ruined state. Repetition as a technique of though I deny this to my children also highlights to the reader and to the speaker um, their generation's culpability in damaging the environment of their children and once again reinforces the dangers of living in denial. You'll notice that the antagonist in the poem are the decent capitalists who profit off a climate disaster making this poem clearly political. And this is an instance of poetry as protest against capitalism, the reason that Earth is ruined, as the antithesis to ecological recovery. The last two lines stood out for me especially because it problematizes the definition of growth, the words growth and sustainability words and terms that are thrown around a lot when people, um, policy makers, um, form and implement policies. All right. So as a reader, I ask myself, what do these words, what do these terms, what kind of ideologies do they hold? What do they mean to different groups of people? And the poem puts pressure on governments and corporations responsible for fracking, logging and bombing places to dust to make systemic changes in policies. Otherwise, it warns that it is our children that will suffer. And so I find that this is a powerful poem, which is also relevant to us in Singapore. Um, and I have written a poem in response to the illegal sand mining issue as well. If we think about the history of land reclamation and our government's culpability in illegal sand mining, the destruction of natural ecosystems, and the livelihoods of tribal communities um, of our neighboring countries where the sand where we acquire and continue to acquire sand from for instance cambodia right so it's, uh, it poses difficult questions that are not easily answered but they do require active citizenry on our part intervention as well from the ground to put pressure on decision makers to effect any real change so this is what Good fossil fuels does for me and I hope that um, when you read it you also feel inspired to do something to take some action all right I'll just go to the comments section now to see what's going on um, okay so uh, okay so Bernice hi Bernice um, she asked where can she find a poem so actually um, this poem that I was reading Le Monde Beach is an uh, unpublished poem of mine so I, I won't um, put it up, but um, I can send it to you separately after this um, video. Okay, so I'll get in touch with you later and share the poem with you. Um, okay, so Crystal says that this poem felt violent and politicized. Yeah, so I guess this is a little bit more um, dissonant. I would say this poem is definitely much more violent, more dissonant. And in a way, I would say this mirrors the process of um, mining for fossil fuels, right? It's also a very violent process. It involves um, something that really um, tears at the earth, okay? It's, it's something we may not be comfortable with. And I'm sure the earth is not comfortable as well, you know, being torn apart. All right, so I'll move on to the next poem, which I hope will be more uplifting. Um, it is Beatitude by Kunle Okesipe. I hope that um, I'm pronouncing your name right, Kunle, um, if and when you watch this video. Um, I apologize if I, if I mispronounce any part of your name. So Kunle's work is published in issue 3 as well, on page 9 of the Tiger Moth Review. And in terms of what he writes back to, 
um, based on my reading, um, in Judeo-Christian belief, the Beatitudes are in fact the eight blessings recounted by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. And so I would say that in the very same spirit, um, Kunle's poem, Beatitude, offers three Beatitudes that bless nature's wonders. And I will read the poem now. Beatitude. Blessed are the tongues of grass, that mark the advent of rains with a signature of green. The needles of the spear grass in the warp and weft of widower stubbles. A file of palm trees and the epaulets of conical fronds. A mob of hoodlum cowage in their ambuscade. Blessed is the subdued tang of basil in the mouth siesta, and the siesta of basil after a meal of the evening sun. To you, old morning, without a memory of a leaf's ash, with a memory of smoke, like a lost necklace, blessed is a joyous beginning, like the first flowers of a pubescent tree. All right, so that was Kunle's poem. Lovely, uplifting poem, okay? Um, a beatitude. So this poem, if you have a look at it on the website, um, it's written in a couplet form, so it means two lines per stanza. And I think that this, this form really serves the content of the poem well in terms of the rhythm and the pace that it creates and it moves the poem. In the first blessing, the speaker acknowledges the importance of the rains in quenching the tongues of plants and trees. For instance, the grass, the spear grass, the palm trees, the cowage. And it demonstrates the interconnectedness of earth, water and sky. In the second blessing, the speaker mentions the subdued tang of basil in the mouth's siesta and the siesta of basil after a meal of the evening sun. So I really love this couplet very much. Um, I find that the parallelism of the lines um, here, where the speaker mentions and repeats certain phrases in different ways, um, draws the reader's attention to one's sense of taste, um, of the tang of basil, and the way in which it titillates one's tongue. The diction here also lulls the reader into a trance-like state of contentment, of sati satiation, of being sated. Um, and I, I, I was really lulled into it, you know, as I read it and as I was reading it as well. And the final blessing is given to the old morning that gives the speaker and readers a joyous beginning each new day. The use of simile in the final image of the first flowers of a pubescent tree connotes new life, a new stage in growth, for instance, uh, puberty and also the flowering stage. And then, of course, fertility, which is a very unique way I find of describing a new day, um, alluding to the ripeness and the richness of the land. And for me, the poem reminds me to practice gratitude and contentment in the little things, to seek wonder and beauty in the simple and the everyday. For instance, in the tang of basil, if you um, season your food with such herbs. And so I have a question for you. Um, if you could write your own beatitude, what would you give thanks for? So you can respond in the comment section, or you can think about it, you can write your own beatitude, you don't have to respond now, but it's just a question that I was pondering and I thought I would share with you. So if you could write your own beatitude, what would you give thanks for? Okay, so I'm going to have a look at the comments now. Um, okay, beatitude. All right. Okay, so... Yeah, so that's uh, in the comment section. Um, Ethan has posted Beatitude. It's there, yep. 
And of course, you can have a look at um, the entire list of the readings if you go to the website, um, the Tiger Moth Review. Maybe I should do that. Um, okay, let me just get the web link, the, the link to the specific page where you can have a look at all the readings from all the previous sessions. And it is included here right now. Okay, so anyone who's watching this video, if you want to have a look at the reading list, just click on the link that says um, Tiger Moth Review times Thrive Hour and you'll be directed to the specific sessions and the readings. All right. Okay, so I've come to my last poem, which is um, my response by Lee Miracle. I hope you enjoyed the previous poem. I hope you enjoyed the Beatitude, um, that it inspired you to be thankful um, for the little things. And the last poem is by Lee Miracle, published in issue two of the Tiger Moth Review on page seven. And um, Lee Miracle is a Stolo, so she is a Coast Salish Nation people um, in Canada. And we'll end with this poem. I have to confess that this is one of my favorite poems in the Tiger Moth Review. Um, I love them all, but I do have some secret favorites. Okay, so let's have a look at this last poem. Uh, before I do that, let me just take some water. All right, I'll read the teaching and then I'll read her poem which responds to the teaching. The call, breath is wind, voice is wind, wind is power. All right, so this is a Stolo teaching and Lee Miracle writes her response, my response. We enter the world wailing, fighting for breath. First breath assaults the skin, offends the body. Insulted, we weep, unsure we want to be here. The woman who bore us murmurs, vocables, intended to soothe, sharpens the surgical light. This first language recedes under soft incantations, family chatter intoning us in urgent nonsense to bond, to connect, to seek joy. These murmurs lighten the burden of being in this, our grand entry into the world of shadow, of light, at times too bright, in folds too dark, wandering without knowing, looking, not seeing, Breath sparks up courage to listen and sing back. Okay, so the above is a teaching that um, the Stolo people um, adhere to when they speak. And I'm thankful to Lee Miracle for sharing her poem with us. All right, so I hope you enjoyed the reading of the poem. Um, the poem, for me, uh, listens and sings back to the Stolo teaching that governs the speaker and the poet's worldview. The emphasis on sound, you might have noticed as I was reading the poem, um, emphasis on sound reminds us of poetry's oratorical history as sound, as vocable, as incantation, as intonation, even as murmur. The power of the breath, the power of the breath giving life to words through sound, the emphasis on language, sound, and meaning without the written word, I think are some of the um, few things that this poem presents to the reader. There is also a distinction made between the power of the breath used mindfully as compared to mindless family chatter and urgent nonsense of talking, right? Um, the poem portrays life to be hard and recognizes the violence with which we enter this world. And when we take our first breath through the diction, like fighting, assaults, offense, insulted, we weep, surgical light, burden of being, wailing in the first line. So in fact, it acknowledges that, you know, when the baby 
um, enters when life is first uh, when life first enters this world it is uh, quite a violent affair the poem also cautions against wandering without knowing looking without seeing and ends on a call for the speaker's own that is to embrace one's life purpose of entering the world of shadow of light as a transformative one from wailing at birth in the opening line to embracing one's breath, one's life, one's power, to have the courage to listen and sing back to this life. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I think that this poem is in fact um, the miracle's way of bringing this solo teaching to life because it comes alive for the speaker through this poem when interpreted, when engaged with, um, by the miracle, when it is listened to, and when it is uh, when there is some singing back done. Okay. Yeah. So yes, Crystal says, "Wow, goosebumps!" Yes, when I was reading the call, especially I had I had goosebumps as well, and uh, that's why this is one of my uh, favorite poems. Strong embodiment judgment. When you use this, have to unlock. Yeah. Okay, so I'm glad you enjoyed um, Lee Mariko's poem. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the poems as well. I know some were a little more jarring, um, and I think it's also quite necessary to have a good mix uh, in terms of uh, perspectives, points of view, and exposes us to, to um, emotions we may be uncomfortable with at times, but are equally quite important that we sit with. Okay, so I've come to the end of uh, my eco-poetry reading. This is also the end of this entire series for me. Um, I thank you so much if you've been watching from um, the first reading. Uh, thank you for, for watching. Thank you for um, your time, for taking the time to listen to the poems, to discuss, to think about them, to ruminate on them. I hope you enjoyed um, today's selection especially and feel free to leave your comments as well if you're watching this later and um, I'll definitely respond to you. Please also donate at the link which Crystal has kindly included in the comment section. Um, all the money goes to needy families at Beyond Social Services and every dollar will be important. I'll also do a shout out. Um, if you write poetry, prose, art or photography um, and you engage with the themes of nature, culture, the environment or ecology, please consider um, submitting your work to the Tiger Moth Review. So we are um, accepting submissions for issue 5 which will be published in January next year. Please also do visit the website to read more work if you would like to. We have four issues out, the latest being issue 4 that was released in May this year. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So thank you so much for watching. Um, whenever you watch, wherever you are, thank you for your time. Uh, yes, so stay healthy and continue to stay safe. And take care. All right. Bye bye. Oh yes. Before I leave, okay. So Shuin says thanks. All right. You are welcome, Shuin. And actually, Shuin's work is also um, featured in the Tiger Moth review. I believe it was issue two that her work was featured, and I read um, and a poem that I paired um, with her work last week as well. Uh, Ao Yang, Ao Yang, uh, White Kids, uh, Allergy for a Silent Stalker. Okay. So thank you so much, everyone, um, for watching this video. Uh, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.